To my right is a pure glass of water. To my left is the chemical equation for a pure glass of water. To my right is what is seen. To my left is what is in the unseen. But without what is on my left being exact, then you will not have what is on my right, pure water. So we find that this is true of the King James Bible. Without an exact chemistry makeup, you will not have the pure word of God. Stay tuned and see the chemistry of the King James Bible. This program is brought to you by Spirit and Truth Christian Jewelry Designs, the kingdom's largest Bible verse jewelry designer, where we believe in the Word of God. Log on to kingdomware.com. Welcome to another episode of Above God's Name. I am Christian rap artist and pastor, the Prophet X, and here is my good friend, G. John Rove. He's the author of this amazing book, Concealed from Christians for the Glory of God, the 1611 KJV. How you doing, G? Excellent. It's another... Abounding in the Lord. How are you? Yes, I'm doing great and prospering also. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So the intro to the show got me just a little bit thirsty. I wish I had some pure water around. You got it right here. (laughs) Go ahead and explain that intro for me. Well, today's episode is going to be fantastic again. We're going to see what's in the unseen regarding the King James Bible. And that's going to be awesome because we're going to see how... We've always talked about this systemic growth that the King James Bible has. And like any growing body, there's an exact physiology to it. Mm -hmm. Now, we're going to start seeing that today. Mm. And we're going to see that if we do not have that, well, what do we have then? We have a monster. Mm. Don't want that. No, we don't don't have that with the King James Bible. This is the Bible that pleases God. This is the Bible that is for God. And therefore, the Bible that is for us. Amen. Let's just get right in the book today. Let's do it. Because we've got a packed, adventurous episode. All right. Sounds good. Yes. All right. Chapter 25, verses. Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read, No one of these shall fail. None shall want her mate. For my mouth it hath commanded, and his spirit it hath gathered them. Isaiah 34, 16. When Jesus, the Word of God made flesh, came into the world, he ministered with miracles, wonders, and signs. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you, by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. Acts 2.22 In fact, as stated in this verse, Jesus was publicly being approved of God by these. Miracles, wonders, and signs. Absolutely. That's the proof. Things that can be seen as well as things that can be, you can look back and verify that it's actually part of the makeup. Miracles, wonders, signs, proving Jesus Mm -hmm. to be indeed the authority figure of God. Mm -hmm. And... Why do we see all the things that we've been bringing out in our program that are miracles, wonders, and signs in the King James Bible? Because God is also proving his authoritative, Mm. authorized word, the King James Bible. Over my shoulder, uh, Matthew 4.4, Luke 4.4, Deuteronomy 8.3. Miracles, wonders, signs, equaling 1611. Mm Mm-hmm. That's twofoldness. Mm -hmm. Twofoldness being Jesus, the authority figure of God, and the King James Bible, the authority figure of God. The Word of God, uppercase W, Jesus, and the Word of God, lowercase W, Jesus, Mm -hmm. twofoldness. Twofoldness, (laughs) meaning that when they come together, they match as the same thing. Mm -hmm. Now, another word for twofoldness mirroring yes and And we're gonna see a lot of that today how God in all of his works he mirrors Mm -hmm. he two folds 
I remember us talking about the, that in one of our previous episodes and bringing out a lot of revelation about how God does that. I'm excited to see some more. We're going to start with some flashbacks, and then we're going to just transition right into some new things, starting here. This is from a previous episode. Uh, gene expression is mirroring, and mirroring is twofoldness. You can see by the dotted line going down our model's face that obviously we have a left side, right side paradigm, and that those match. They mirror, they twofold. This is the work of the creator. This is his design uh, insignia that you are looking at. Now, we see it down here in twins, which is also a form of mirroring. Because, lo and behold, the one matches the other, as if we're looking at the same girl in a mirror. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, let's look at this next one, and let's see that as the Bible is a body of literature, even a living body, a living word, so it, even with the ribbon placed by God, shows us this same manifold design uh, detail that the Creator loves, a mirroring effect. The living word's body is a mirroring nature. Now, we're going to look at Acts 2.22, which was in the paragraph we just read. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves also know. Acts 2.22. This verse has a mate. We'll call this mate number one. When we go to Hebrews 2.4, we're seeing the mate. God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Hebrews 2.4. These are the only two verses in the Bible that use the words miracles, wonders, and signs in the same verse. Now, look at how they mirror each other. Acts 2.22 on the left, Hebrews 2.4 on the right. We have signs, matching with signs, because this is the order that they came out. Uh, miracles, wonders, signs is the order that they rolled out in Acts 2.22. Signs, wonders, miracles is the order in Hebrews 2.4. So signs matching signs, wonders matching wonders, being in the middle position, miracles matching miracles on the outer position. So we see a mirroring effect in the only two verses that have these three words in the King James Bible. Take a look here. Mirroring mates, Acts 2, 22 and Hebrews 2, 4. Even the references uh, match with a mirroring effect. And I know you're saying, how are those mirroring? I'm glad you asked, because I'm just about to show you. You should see it this way. Mirroring mates, Acts 2, 2, 2, and Hebrews 2, 2, 2. Because when we get 2 plus 2, it gives us the 4 of Hebrews 2, 4. This is how you should see it if you're going to break down the scriptures and begin to rightly divide to see the inner workings of what God is doing. If you want to see it all put together, let's look at it this way. Mirroring mates, miracles, wonders, signs. Miracles is the two representing the chapter two. Wonders is the two of the 22. Signs, two of the 22. Signs, wonders, miracles. And the Hebrews verse would be two, two, two. It's as, as if... God has applied a two to each of the factors. And according to his creative work, this is what he does. If we look at it in a chiastic form, we did an entire program on the chiasms of the Bible. We see what that looks like. Acts 2, 22, the two goes with the miracles, two goes with the wonders, two goes with the signs. And then in the Hebrews 2, 2 plus 2, which is Hebrews 2, 4, we see that it matches again. And we're seeing a complex structure. Wow, that's, uh, 
That's amazing. Never seen it laid out quite like that. But I'm big into the mates in the scriptures. Right. But never seen it made it in such great detail like that. Well, think about our intro, uh, a glass of water and the equation for water. Mm -hmm. Without the one, you don't have the reality of the other. That's right. And you don't have the exactness of the other. Mm. And that's what we're going into today. Mm. That's what we're seeing. Do you have to know these things uh, to believe on God's word and to believe God finished the King James Bible? No, no. you don't. But when you believe and you see these things, you're worshiping God and marveling God. Amen. I think uh, that would be an argument that a skeptic would say, I don't need to know all that complex stuff to believe on the word of God. And no, you don't. But it does help you to prove that this is the authentic word of God. And we know the scripture says, prove all things. Amen. Amen. Well, speaking of skeptics, let's go on with the two, 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 a little deeper. <laughs> All right, we're going to start at the end of the Bible for our first mate. This is the very last 222 verse in the Bible, and it's uh, Revelation 22.2. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life. And then the verse continues. If we look at that visually, uh, Revelation 22.2, the last 22.2 verse, Notice how the two in the middle is mirroring itself to the left and the right. And if we put together visually what it might look like in the New Jerusalem, we see that in the midst of the street where the two is, and on either side of the river was there the tree of life. So we have a match. It all matches. There's a harmony according to the verse. Now let's go to this verse's mate. And that's going to be the very first 222 verse of the Bible, as in Genesis 222. So we looked at the last 222, now we're looking at the first 222. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Unless you have eyes to see, you won't see how this relates to Revelation 22.2. But when we go into the reality of this prophecy, this is the death of Jesus Christ at Calvary. Indeed, even at Mount Moriah. So, let's take a look at that with this verse in mind. Here is the crucifixion that is being prophesied in the type of Isaac on Mount Moriah. Genesis 22.2, the first 22.2 verse. Notice 2.2.2. Two, two. Just like in Revelation 22.2, on each side of the river was the tree of life. So we see a thief to the left and a thief to the right. So we have a two in the middle, a two on the left, a two on the right. And then in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life. Let's look at this close-up of Jesus himself on the cross. Notice in the middle, river of water from his pierced side. Just like in Revelation 22, 2, in the midst of the street was the river of life. So we see that Jesus is the reality of that road. He is the way. And then on either side of the pierced side of Jesus, above or below, we are looking at the tree of life. He is the tree of life on either side of the river flowing out of his side. Man. Amazing. And sometimes you, you see stuff, like when I sit and I study this with you, I see things for the first time. Having read that Genesis 2, 22, a hundred times, never did I ever think that it was pointing to what you just showed there. It's another chiasm. It's part yeah. of the chiasm because it's book ends. Mm. You have Genesis 22, 2. You have Revela uh, Revelation 22, 2, mm -hmm. the first and the last. And they're both testifying to Jesus in the exact same way with the water in the midst, the living water, yeah. and the tree of life on either side. Yeah. So these are the things that make up the Bible by the design of the designer, and they mirror, and they are twofoldness. Mm. Okay? Uh, Genesis 2.22, it's there. Genesis 22, 22, it's there. Mm -hmm. uh, if we were to look at Genesis 2.22, you would see it there also. Mm -hmm. uh, Exodus 2.22, it's actually there too. Wow. Now, you guys can all look that up in your own time, and you may or may not see what I'm talking about. Just like Genesis 22.2 is very 
uh, difficult to discern unless you can see deeply mm -hmm. into the working of the Spirit. Yeah. But look those up in your own time, viewer, and see if you can figure it out. And you want to know what's really interesting? What's that? Is uh, when I was putting all this together, uh, all this two, 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 I stumbled across something that the Lord showed me that I wasn't even searching for, mm. but somehow it popped up before me. I was born August 9th in 1968, and it was showing me that August 9th of 1968, the day I was born, was the 222nd day of 1968. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't even looking for it. Yeah. It came up in a search somehow, some way. Mm. And doing all this 22, two, 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 two stuff, I was yeah. like, Lord, I know you're showing me that mm -hmm. because you're just showing me how true all of this is that you're working by your spirit, Amen. including the day that you had me to part the waters and mm. enter into this world. Wow. To witness of the tree of life. Amen. Amen. Let's move on to the next. God has likewise been ministering miracles, wonders, and signs in the King James Bible to the world in real life and in real time for over 400 years. These miracles, signs, and wonders are God's public approval to all men as to which Bible is sourced and finished of Him. We have been seeing many of these miracles, wonders, and signs and they are literally unending beyond what will be shared in this book. Surely, at the last day, God will be making His boast to the world of unbelievers by His Son and by His Word, the Bible. Be reminded of this verse we covered on books in chapter 23. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him, the word that I have spoken. The same shall judge him in the last day. John 12, 48. God is revealing miracles, wonders, and signs found in the King James Bible, fresh to believers all around the world. We are seeing things a lot of times on this program that believers probably have never, ever seen before. Yeah. I've said before, like the scribe of the kingdom, something old, something new, mm -hmm. things I've learned from Christians who've gone ahead of us. Mm -hmm things that I'm bringing that the Lord has shown me directly. And a lot of times we refer to the cover of the book because it's such a profound miracle. Mm -hmm. Let's look at something unique about that. Notice in the Luke 4, 3 episode where Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness, Satan made a request for a miracle, wonder, and sign. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. That's Luke 4, 3. And in the very next verse, notice, request denied for a miracle wonder sign. And Jesus answered him saying, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God, Luke 4, 4. When we go to the Gospel of Matthew, look at how these verses mate each other. The same thing takes place in the exact same 4, 3 slot and 4, 4 slot. That's chapter 4, verse 3. Request for miracle, wonder, and sign made by Satan. Request denied for miracle, wonder, and sign by Jesus, saying the same thing that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Period. Now, when it comes to the church, however, notice request not asked for by the church for a miracle, wonder, and a sign and yet, request is granted for a miracle, wonder, and sign using those verses. In God's timing, the year 1611 is revealed to identify the 1611 King James Bible as the bread of God that man is to every day have as his sustenance. Now, take a look at the cover of the book, Luke 4.4, 4, which we discovered, Matthew 4.4, 4, which we discovered, they're sourcing from Deuteronomy 8.3 in the Old Testament, saying the exact same thing, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Notice Luke 4.4 represents miracles, Acts 2.22 and Hebrews 2.2 2 plus 2. We covered that. Matthew 4.4 4, wonders, Acts 2.22, Hebrews 2.2 2 plus 2, what we covered. And Deuteronomy 8.3 for signs, Acts 2, 22, Hebrews 2, 2 plus 2. 
add the chapters, add the verses. 1611, the year of the King James Bible, when it was published, and the bread of God out of his mouth. And that was a great breakdown showing Satan was making his request of Jesus for a sign or a miracle and access denied. He shut him down. Right. But then, like you said, the church did not make a request, but God fulfilled that unspoken request and gave revelation on that. Yes. That was very powerful. So the same thing that Satan asked a miracle for mm -hmm. and was denied is the same place mm -hmm. where God did perform a miracle, but in his timing. God mm -hmm. does all things in his timing, yeah. revealing 1611, the year of the King James Bible. Mm -hmm. Infamous year. Yeah. Infamous year. And, you know, Jesus does this a lot because Satan... Uh, if you think of Isaiah chapter 14, the five I am, mm -hmm. uh, I will statements, I will. Yeah. right? So the things that he wants to be like the Most High, denied. Mm -hmm. But they're being given to the church because the church will be glorified with the body and soul and spirit life of the divine nature in resurrection. Mm -hmm. Denied, granted. Yeah, We see it a lot in the scriptures. John uh, 7, 5 through 10, if you go look at that real quick, his brothers were saying, go up to the feast in Jerusalem. Jesus mm -hmm. denied yeah. their timing, didn't yeah, he? That's right. But then after, he, he went, went in his timing. Yeah. So we see the miracle on the cover of this book is about God's timing, mm -hmm. the release of this miracle. Yes. These miracles in the King James Bible are fresh. They're coming out all the time in God's timing. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Uh, let's go and take a look at uh, something that's going to prepare us for the next section, uh, what we're going to look at. Okay, viewer, keep in mind that we are looking into the chemistry of the finished Bible. And for that, we're going to need to understand what simple gematria is. Uh, gematria is numeric value assigned to letters. God has employed gematria in the Bible from the beginning. We have an aleph here, which is the Hebrew letter, uh, first letter of the alphabet, because it's the first letter, it has the numeric value of 1. Under it is Alpha in the Greek. Alpha for the New Testament also. Uh, it was the employment of gematria because both Hebrew Old Testament and Greek New Testament did not have numbers. I repeat, did not have numbers. God employed gematria to speak numbers by the addition of the numeric value of letters. Ultimately, Aleph, Alpha, is where we get our A from. That's the English letter A, which would obviously in simple gematria have also the value of one. So B would have the numeric value of two, C would have the numeric value of three, D would be four, etc. And in this way, we get numeric values assigned to words. This is what God has always done. And it's no different in the finished Bible. So let's take a look at what we've just been covering and let's look at the simple English gematria. Luke 4.4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of God, which is repeated in Matthew 4.4, 4, which is repeated in Deuteronomy 8.3. Those are the three scriptures for those verses. When you put in Luke 4.4, 4, Matthew 4.4, 4, Deuteronomy 8.3, you get a numeric value of 321. That's three. Two, one. Now, we know that these verses are for miracles, wonders, and signs. Now, the only two books with a verse containing the words miracles, wonders, and signs is Acts, which we covered, and Hebrews, which we covered. The words Acts and Hebrews gives us a numeric value of one, two, three. So, we see that we have a mirror going on here, mating these scriptures together. So Luke 4.4, 4, Matthew 4.4, 4, Deuteronomy 8.3, equaling 3, 2, 1. And the only verses in the Bible are from Acts and Hebrews that have shared in a single verse, miracles, wonders, signs. Acts, Hebrews has a numeric value of 1, 2, 3. And we see how they indeed are mirroring each other. 3, 2, 1, 1, 2, 3. When we take the 3, the 2 and the 1, and we add it up, we have a 6. When we take the 1, the 2, and the 3, we add it up, we have a 6. That gives us 66, 6 and a 6 in the mirroring. That roots us 
into the 66 books of the Bible, showing how all of this has a systemic path leading to itself intravenously. Now, what you did right there is very foreign for a lot of Christians because they start thinking that's you're doing some kind of black magic or voodoo or something. And the truth is you're just doing what the Bible says you're counting to know, to, to figure out the wisdom of it. And when you right. when you got that Acts and Hebrews and you're adding the numerical value for all of those letters and it produces the 123, we can clearly see that 123 is a mirror image of the 321. It's almost like they're folded like this and you just opened up and saw the wisdom in between. Yeah, them. a miracle sign and a wonder. Yeah. What we see on the cover. Yeah. With its references added up. Mm -hmm. You have the numeric value of 321. Mm. And then the only books in the Bible that have Hebrews uh, and Acts as wonders, uh, miracles, wonders, signs, those mm -hmm. are the only two books that yeah. that verse appears in. You have a one, two, three. And it is deep, and you don't have to know it. Right. But you get to know it. Hmm. Uh, and you know, maybe I'm just one of those nerds, <laughs> right? The computer geek yeah. is all math, isn't he? Yeah, he is. And the chemistry and physiology geek, the scientist in the lab, he's all numbers, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, that's right. And maybe you don't like talking to him, or maybe you say, wow, <laughs> that's just who I am, and that's what I see. And yeah, it, yeah. it validates uh, exactly that these things are not happening by chance, but there's I'm sure some of our viewers out there are on that same level and they absolutely appreciate the depth at which you take our understanding of the King James Bible. Amen, amen. I mean, God used Gematria, mm -hmm. period. He yeah. employed Gematria, period. Mm -hmm. So we are walking in what he has divided. Mm. All right, let's move on. You may think it is unimportant to believe that God has finished a Bible. Apart from the risk of standing exposed as an unbeliever, to your own surprise, at the last day, John 12, 48, have you considered the following? Are you not trusting God to finish the work of salvation in you that he began, Philippians 1, 6? Doesn't he need to gather every detail related to this in your life, bring it to pass, and bring it to a matured completion? And are you not trusting the Lord to keep track of your corrupted, dishonorable, and weak body which is being sown into the earth, to gather it all and raise it up entirely in incorruption, glory, power, and immortality into a spiritual body at the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, 42-44. And when Enoch was translated from this world, not seeing death, and gathered unto the Lord, needn't he trust that God would make this complete and perfect, Hebrews 11:5? And when Philip was caught away after baptizing the Ethiopian eunuch, needn't he trust that the Lord would gather him complete and perfect for this relocating? Acts 8, 39 and 40. And should you, the last day's believer, be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, are you not trusting the Lord to gather you correctly, entirely and in perfection? 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. Here is the case in point for all of these gatherings listed above. My mouth it hath commanded, and his spirit it hath gathered them. Isaiah 34, 16. In other words, God himself has done it. You can trust him to do them all completely, correctly, entirely, and perfectly. In that selection of paragraphs, I by the time we got to the end of it, I totally realized that I have to be 100% trusting God to translate in entirety so that like my hand is not left somewhere or my right. foot is not over there so that no part of the translation is left out. Can I say something? Go ahead. The section we just covered that had that very difficult uh, connection that's going on between the three verses mm -hmm. and the book of Hebrews and Acts, uh, signs, wonders, miracles. And I said, you know, that's like code that's going on yeah. behind, behind the, scenes. the scenes. We're all looking to God for the translation that's about to take place mm -hmm. uh, soon down the road. But we don't realize that there's a science behind that. Mm -hmm. Not science falsely so-called yeah. that the world possesses, but there's actually a code that's going to be involved in that. Coding is going to go on so that what you just said doesn't happen. Yeah. So that you are taken from, let's just say, 
corruptible to mm -hmm. incorruptible. That's right. Uh, from mortal to immortal. We take it for granted. And so with the Bible, we take the translation for granted as well. Mm -hmm. Anyone can come and translate the Bible. A better translation of this word is this. No, there's a coding behind all of this, just like the translation is going to have a coding behind it mm -hmm. so that everything is in its proper place in its final destination. Yeah. The final destination for the Word of God, the King James Bible. Mm. That's very well put. Right. Amen. And the verses have all been gathered by the Spirit accordingly. Well, I love that the Scripture, you know, our header verse, it actually says gathered. And that's what's going to take place, the gathering. They're gathered together and translated. Yes. Not haphazardly strewn like they do with other translations. Correct, correct. Rapture is a word that the enemy has sown. Mm -hmm. And it's seemingly benign. But what it has done is it has taken your mind, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Mm -hmm. It's taking your mind away from God's word translation yes, and put it on a, a word that's primarily emotionally based. Mm -hmm. Rapture. Excitement. Yeah. Rapture. Mm -hmm. But if you were to consistently use the word translate and translation instead of the word rapture, you would start to have embedded in your mind, transforming you, this mm -hmm. concept, which is the truth, that God is a translator. Yes. Because what we're bringing out on this show is showing the, the viewers how God has translated the Hebrew and the Greek into English mm. perfectly because he is a translator. Amen. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Let us continue in the book. All of these gatherings are also cases of translation. To translate means to change something's location or its form or its condition or even its nature. It means to take something from one state and gather it into a new state. God uses the word translate one time and the word translated two times in the King James Bible. In each and every case of the three usages of the words, it is taking something inferior and translating it into a superior condition. The kingdom was translated from Saul to David, 2 Samuel 3.10. Enoch was translated from this world to the next, Hebrews 11.5. And the church has been translated from the power of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son, Colossians 1.13. These are all superior translations of God. This is also the case for God's finished Bible in the King James Version. It has taken the Hebrew and Greek and a little Aramaic and translated them into a superior English Bible for God's glory. Recall this verse, which came up in chapter 5 of this book. Truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Psalm 138, 2. All the cases that God uses the word translation, translate the derivatives thereof, is always from an inferior to a superior. And it's always from one kingdom into another kingdom or one nation into another nation, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, interestingly enough, when he chooses the word translation as his perfect word for describing what everyone calls the rapture, mm -hmm. translation has built into it the word trans, which is to cross over, and the word nation. Mm -hmm. So it's to cross over from one nation into another nation. When we are translated, that's what we will be doing. Mm -hmm. We will be going from one nation mm. into a new nation. That's right. Okay? So, do all of these translations of the Bible that are out, do they meet this definition? Are they going from an earthly status to a heavenly status in their translation? Or are they just the work of men? Mm. They're wood, hay, and stubble. They're not going from one nation to another nation. Yeah. But with the King James Bible, God has taken the word and in translating it, exalted it to the quality and caliber of heaven's issue, mm. issued from heaven. Amen. So, as, as you're saying that about uh, the trance and the nation being in there, I, I came to my mind that 
they're not translations, they're revisions, which means a different vision. Right. And that's what they're sowing, that's what they're giving the world, a different vision. Correct. We often say Antichrist. They're mm. Antichrist. Yeah. They are. They are. And you know what? They are a sign of the last days because what's going to happen in the last days? Hmm. Nation shall rise against nation. <laughs> yeah, and true. we see that in the plethora of all of these false translations, which really mm. are books, mm -hmm. books, not Bibles. I don't even call them Bibles. Amen. They're books. Yeah. And they're of the nation of the world, mm. and they're going against the nation of heaven That's with right. the King James Bible. Amen. We have thus seen that the books of the Bible have all been selected by God. They have all been ordered by God, and God has divided the chapters. The books, the order, and the chapters all have to do with his gathering, to which he says, no one of these shall fail. None shall want her mate, Isaiah 34, 16. We must know that this gathering of the whole is nothing without its parts. So we rhetorically ask, are all the verses of the Bible gathered and placed and numbered by God as well? To answer no here is to discredit the Word of God, which shows otherwise on every page. It also means you believe God has departed the raising of His Word, the Bible, at this incomplete place, and the glory of these miracles, wonders, and signs belong to another. We're at that challenging moment again in each one of our, uh, in each one of these most recent chapters of the book where the viewer has to be challenged to answer that question. Do you think God is still in it or did he depart from the process right. at this point? Right. It's like the game Hangman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. That's really good. And people who think that he's departed from the scene mm -hmm. and yet you say the scriptures are inerrant, the scriptures are inspired. Mm -hmm. You are a walking, talking contradiction. Yeah. We are not a walking, talking contradiction. We are a walking, talking testimony yes. of the Word of God. Yeah. Because we will show you the Bible that God has finished. Amen. We will show you the perfect Bible. You must shun any such idea that the verses in the Bible just happen to be where they are, as if through wandering they have just ended up being there. Cain was a wanderer. When he went out from the presence of the Lord, he dwelt in the land of Nod, on the east of Eden, Genesis 4, 16. The name Nod means to wander. Cain's father, Satan, was also a wanderer. He goes to and fro and up and down in the earth, Job 2, 2. In fact, all those who follow Satan, God calls wanderers in the King James Bible, Jude 13. These verses have not wandered into their positions, and anyone who thinks they are, are like the wandering stars themselves of Jude 13. Let's look at that whole section of Jude, and let's apply it to this topic of the pure word of God. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. Condemning your KJV only brother, who is more righteous than you for believing God in the matter of his pure word and ran greedily after the era of Balaam for reward. Bible publishers, translators for hire. And perished in the gainsaying of Korah. Those who have rebelled against the 400-year standard of God's authorized version. These are spots in your feasts of charity, when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Spotting the church with many translations, eating from any of them they feel. Clouds they are without water telling you the Bible is inerrant, inspired, but possessing no such Bible. Carried about of winds. Going from translation to translation to suit themselves. Trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. America's weakest ever generation of Christians accompanying man-made translations. Raging waves of the sea foaming out of their own shame. Famous persons in the church denouncing the authority of the King James Bible. Wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Famous persons in the church wandering from the authority of the King James Bible. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. There's Enoch we talked about. Enoch was translated correctly 
That's a rebuke to all who do not trust in God to translate the word of God perfectly. To execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Think of all the ungodly and hard speech spoken of Jesus, the word of God. Apply that to the King James Bible which people speak against as well. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Boasting words like, God's word is better translated like this, for scholarly admiration. But, beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time, who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. Mocking the KJV, God finished, is everywhere. This is why the world is in the judgment it is today. The church has rejected the word of God, the King James Bible. I have said this from the beginning of our program before we entered any of this madness that we're experiencing in the world today. Hmm. Way before. I said the reason that the world will be judged is because the church has cast out the King James Bible. That's right. Did I not say that? You said that. And you are seeing the fruit of it today in your social distancing, your masks, your pandemic, mm -hmm. your contact tracing, your coin shortage, yeah. your money grab that's going on, and woe for all of the woes that are ahead of us in the fall. So get back to the King James Bible immediately. Absolutely. We're helping you to do that. We are mated to the King James Bible. And if you're mated to anything else, you're mated to the wrong thing. Let's keep moving into the next paragraph. Amen. No, God has meticulously placed all the verses in the mature King James Bible and done so as for each to have a mate, Isaiah 34, 16. Beginning with the judgment of the chief wanderer himself, here is a very simple example of a verse and its mate. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Genesis 3.14 Genesis 3.14 is the commencing verse of the judgment of Satan in the Old Testament. We see its New Testament ratification in John 3.14 because these verses are mated together. In John 3.14, Jesus is re-instructing Nicodemus back to the commencing verse of the original judgment of the serpent in Genesis 3.14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. John 3.14. Once illuminated to things like the above match, Genesis 3.14, John 3.14, Verses and their mates will begin to manifest everywhere in your opening of the King James Bible. The mating of the scriptures in the King James Bible for me is one of the uh, clear evidences of God's um, divine hand and, and finger pointing to those things because you don't have those mates in other versions of the Bible, in other books. You don't, <laughs> you don't have those mates. They're completely missing because the content has been changed, the words have been changed. Even the numbers probably don't even match up. It's sometimes so they don't. Sometimes they don't. Let's acknowledge this. Yeah. On occasion, they do match. Yeah. Of course, and Rarely. Let, me tell you, <laughs> let me tell you why they match, is because okay. they are all uh, impersonating the King James Bible mm -hmm as much as they can. Yeah. But the content is going to change on those Bibles. The words, mm -hmm. the letters, uh, the amount of words, etc. Right. And they're going to completely stumble at that point. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll be true to what's true and I'll betray in truth what needs to be betrayed in okay. truth. So in all fairness to them, uh, they do match on occasion, but it's because they're copying mm -hmm. the King James Bible. All right. Now we looked at uh, Genesis 3.14 and John 3.14, let's put them up real quick, starting with John, we'll work our way backwards, okay? So we have a teaching that Jesus gave Nicodemus, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. John 3.14, 
Well, where did that come from? Well, it came from Genesis 3.14. So we have a picture. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, there's the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Now, I highlighted and underlined, thou art cursed, because in John 3, 14, it said, the Son of Man be lifted up. Jesus was made a curse for us all. Now, that's really clever how you did that, because he was made a curse for us, because the scripture says, cursed is he that hangeth upon the tree. Yes. So, yes. lift it up. I get it. Yes. Now, using those uh, same two passage entries, we see yet again another mating taking place. Now, that same passage out of John, the teaching, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, takes place in John, which is book number four of the New Testament. Book four. We have the picture, teaching in a picture, from Numbers, which is book four of the Old Testament. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. So, book four, New Testament, mated by content, the book four of the Old Testament. The mating gets deeper and deeper because not only does it mate by the content, by the words, but it also mates by the location and placement in the Bible. Yeah, that's really the seal mm. showing you that they belong together. That was Genesis three fourteen. we were kicking off of. If we go two verses prior into Genesis three 12, I'll show you another mating because mates are all over the Bible like this where the contents, chapter and verses are matching. So goes on and on and on and on and on. Take a look. Here's a teaching from Isaiah chapter 3, verse 12. As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. Where do we have the picture? Well, we have the picture of that in Genesis 3, 12, where it roots from the beginning. Here's the picture. And the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And we all know that the path of Adam was destroyed by the woman who ruled over him. More proof that God has made it his word. I think that even the pictures and the teachings are, a, uh, are mating on a different level because not everybody is a wordsmith like you. Some people are visual learners. So there's always that picture that's in there that mates with the word teaching. Mm -hmm. yeah. Those chapter verse matches, mm. they're practically endless. Mm. It's, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Why? Why is this going on in the finished Bible? Some people would say it's a coincidence. Right. But hopefully at this point in our program, if you've been watching our episodes, you know none of this is a coincidence. This is, this is talking about the, the, the nature of God, the right. nature, right? The right. divine nature. Right. I'm going to give you an exact answer, simple and true. Hmm. The Bible has two natures. Okay. It has the divine nature, which is why we see these miracles, wonders, and signs. Mm -hmm. And it has the human nature, Mm. which is why we see the humanity coming out in the Word of God mm. and the human replication of letters, mm. words, numbers. Mm -hmm. It's a book from beginning to end, really, of miracles, wonders, and signs on the most obvious uh, outer layer, just reading about the miracles, wonders, and signs that take place, and on its molecular level as well. Mm. Amen. Right on. Here is an example of a flock of verses, first in Matthew, then in Mark, then in Luke. And everyone that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Matthew 19, 29, and 30. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, 
There is no man that hath left house, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake and the gospel's. But he shall receive an hundredfold, now in this time, houses, and brethren, and sisters, and mothers, and in the world to come, eternal life. Mark 10, 29 and 30. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or parents, or brethren, or wife, or children, for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come, life everlasting. Luke 18, 29, and 30. All three of these clusters have rooted themselves in the verse 29 and 30 position. Do not think that this is a synoptic gospel copying issue. These three are mates. Matthew's verses 29 and 30 come at the end of the chapter. Mark's verses 29 and 30 come in a chapter which continues up to 52 verses. And Luke's verses 29 and 30 come in a chapter of 43 total verses. Nonetheless, these verses would not wander out of place in their chapter, but all have halted themselves in the 29 and 30 verse positions to set together. The subject matter of these verses is very appropriate for a 30 anchoring, since that was the age that Jesus himself left house, brethren, sisters, mother, opportunity for wife and all, for the gospel and for the kingdom. Luke 3, 23. Amen. I was very profound three scriptures from three different gospels, but they're all located in the same section of the chapter, verse 29 and 30. Even if the chapters have more verses after it, it wasn't like they just said, well, this is the last part of all three. They are all purposely put in the 29 and 30 position. Yeah, it's kind of like your hand. Mm. Um, This finger and this finger grew out to be the exact same length equal to each other. This finger and this finger grew out to be the exact same length equal to each other, and so on and so on, including Mm -hmm. the thumbs. This is the way God, who is the designer of body, Mm -hmm. designs. So we are seeing God's design. That's what we're seeing. Amen. Okay, let's look at it. The calling of Jesus. Leave everything for Jesus. Matthew's account, chapter 19, ending in verse 29 and 30. That's where it lodges. Leave everything for Jesus. Mark's account. Chapter 10, verse 29 and 30. And leave everything for Jesus. Luke's account. Chapter 18, verse 29 and 30. And, according to the Gospels, Jesus left everything for the Father at age 30. They all match. I can just hear Jesus in the days of his flesh. When I turn verse 30, I I mean age 30, (laughs) I will be following after the Father. I can just imagine him saying that. (laughs) That's great. These verses are all set in the King James Bible like diamonds in their place, Mm. in their proper setting, just gripped just right. If you do not believe that these verses were set by God in the King James Bible like diamonds, consider the following example from the New Testament again. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, Romans 6.6. 6. We have nailed it down before that six is the number of man, as man was created on the sixth day. The word man in this verse is the sixth word, of the sixth verse, of the sixth chapter, of the sixth book of the New Testament in the King James Bible. This too is mating. Wow, I gotta see this one. This one I gotta see, that was was amazing. The sixth word of the sixth this of the, show it to me. Man is represented by the number six. Of course, he was created on the sixth day. Man is word number six in verse number six of chapter number six in the New Testament book number six, which is Romans 6, 6. Wow, now that, 
Seeing it like that, all the that's amazing. That's amazing. God <laughs> is romance. I'm telling you, and, and people think there's no Bible that he's finished. Yeah. Entire chapters can be mated as well. Going back into the Old Testament, let's look at Psalm 100 verse 3, which is a very famous scripture. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Psalm 100 verse 3. Psalm 100 has a total verse count of 1 through 5 with this famous sheep scripture being in verse 3. These specifics mate it to the most famous 100 sheep verse in the New Testament, which begins in Luke 15 and verse 3, where Jesus tells the parable of the lost sheep. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man among you having an hundred sheep, if he loses one of them? Luke 15, 3 and forward. These mates share the 100 sheep and the one and the five and the three for infrastructure, strength, continuity, relationship, symmetry, emphasis, value, beauty, prestige, perfection. Psalm 100 verses 1 through 5 in verse 3 mated to 100 sheep in Luke 15 verse 3. Want to see what that looks like? Yeah. Mate number one and mate number two. So in Psalm 100, one through five, we can see that as a 15. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. That's from verse three. Mate number two, we see the relationships going on, highlighted in red. Luke 1, five, chapter 15, that is, verse three, they're both in the verse 3 slot. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, Which parable? It's the parable of the 100 sheep. Notice all of the mating that's going on between these two, including their addresses and content, all bound together in relationship. It's just another example that reminds me that I got to learn to, to kind of read outside the box. Mm -hmm. Also consider the numbers, consider the verse placement, consider that God has translated it exactly the way that he wants it. That's what I gotta do. <laughs> the way that pleases him. Yeah. Now, I wanna show a very uh, complex uh, series where this is going on from Joshua. Mm. I wanna explain one thing first because the viewer may not have the knowledge uh, regarding Joshua and the fall of Jericho which we all are, from the time we were kids, yeah. aware of that story. Yes. But the viewer may not know that the fall of Jericho is prophecy of the fall of Babylon in Revelation. And at the same time, the being caught up or translation, which we covered earlier, of the church. Mm. I want to read one verse from Joshua chapter 6, and it is going to be in uh, verse Five, and it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, now think First Thessalonians 4, 16, and 17. That's right. All the people shall shout with a great shout. So we have the trump of God. We have the shout of mm -hmm. the archangel. Mm -hmm. And the wall of the city shall fall down flat. That's Revelation chapters uh, 17, 18. Mm -hmm. And the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. That is the translation mm -hmm. taking place in picture teaching. Mm. Viewer, go back, study it deeper, thresh it out. It also appears in verse 20 of Joshua 6. You needed to establish that first mm -hmm. in at least a basic way. Yeah, That is prophecy, that is picture taking place, which is to be revealed clearly by the teaching of the New Testament. Now, let's look at this incredible mating of chapters and verses to the book of Revelation, matching and showing a series of pictures of the fall of Babylon, pictured in the prophecy of the fall of the walls of Jericho, the great city. 
Look at the chapter, verse mates. First Joshua, then Revelation. We're going to do a whole series. Babylon sown in Joshua. And it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and compassed the city after the same manner seven times. Only on that day they compassed the city seven times. That's Joshua 6, 15. When we mirror it and we go to Revelation 15, 6, we start to see the contents emerging. And the seven angels came out of the temple having the seven plagues clothed in pure and white linen and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. Babylon harvested in Revelation. Sown in Joshua, harvested in Revelation. We see in Joshua these sevens, they're lining up, they're getting ready mm -hmm. to come out and judge Jericho. And we see in the Revelation 15, 6 verse, everything's starting to happen likewise with the angels. The sevens are gathering, they're coming out, and they're getting ready to go and judge Babylon. Mm. Continuing with Babylon sown in Joshua, and it came to pass at the seventh time when the priests blew with the trumpets, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. Joshua 6, 16. When we mirror this in Revelation, Revelation 16, 6, it says, For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. Babylon harvested in Revelation. So in Joshua, it's judgment time. Mm -hmm. And in Revelation, when we mirror it, we see that they are worthy of this judgment. And God expresses how worthy Babylon is of this judgment. And our next verse in Joshua, Babylon sown in Joshua, and the city shall be accursed, even it and all that are therein to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all that are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. That's Joshua 6, 17. That was the next verse. Revelation 17, 6. Let's mirror it. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And here we have the harlot in Joshua. And we have the harlot mm. who's sitting over Babylon. That's right. Next in Joshua, Babylon sown in Joshua. And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed. When ye take of the accursed thing, and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. Joshua 6, 18. Mirror that. Revelation 18, 6. Reward her, even as she rewarded you, and double unto her, double according to her works. In the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. Babylon harvested in Revelation. So here in Joshua, we're warned of the accursed thing they need to stay away from. In Revelation, we see that the harlot, what she's holding in her hand, is the embodiment, mm. the cup full of all of the accursed that the Lord is cursing. Mm -hmm. Next in Joshua, Babylon, sown in Joshua, but all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. Joshua 6, 19, mirrored in Revelation 19, 6. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. In Joshua, we see that it all had become the Lord's. Mm -hmm. In Revelation, we see Babylon destroyed, and it becomes all the Lord's. Mm -hmm. They're mirroring mm -hmm. each other. Finally, in Babylon sown in Joshua, we see in 620. So the people shouted when the priests blew with the trumpets. And it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet. And the people shouted with a great shout that the wall fell down flat. So that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him. And they took the city. Joshua 6, 20, mirrored in Revelation 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Babylon harvested in Revelation. So here we see in Joshua, the people went up, every man straight before him. And our Revelation counterpart, blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Mm -hmm. That is 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. That's when right. the dead in Christ mm -hmm. and we which remain alive are resurrected. That is the first resurrection. Mm -hmm. 
Mirror. Yeah, I see it. Mirror. They all mirror. That's amazing. All those verses in a row mirroring their content in the book of Revelation. Who did that? Who did that? I ask. God. <laughs> God's field of vision is not limited like ours. Man has straightforward vision with a very small amount of peripheral vision. When we read the Bible, we only see one single word of one single verse in focus at a time. That verse is surrounded by other verses in a chapter that is surrounded by other chapters, that is in a book surrounded by other books, making up the Bible. God's vision is everywhere. It sees the entire Bible in dimensional focus all at once. It must be perfect in His sight from every angle and from every perspective, and it must glorify Him by adorning the doctrine of God at every depth of examination. When we're talking about God seeing in all dimensions at once, that's part of the, uh, the, the majesty of God mm -hmm. and, and the incompleteness of man. We're only in this one dimension that we're living in. Everything is physical, right? And so eventually we graduate to where it becomes mental. We're thinking about more things and then the highest level being spiritual. But God, knowing the end from the very beginning is seeing all of this at once. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. We said that the Bible has two natures, mm -hmm. a divine nature and a human nature. Yeah. Well, that's in accordance with Jesus, the Word of God, as well, because mm -hmm. he has a divine nature and a human nature. Yes. We all saw his divine nature when he performed a miracle at times like that. Mm. But what about when he was just at rest? Who saw his divine nature? Well, God, the Father, was always seeing his divine nature. Mm. And when it comes to the divine nature of the Bible, with all of these miraculous uh, signs and wonderful things that it's doing, we may not see them, but God is always seeing them, even when they're at rest in our presence. In other words, we don't know about them. Mm -hmm. They're at rest in our presence. He sees them. The Bible is first and foremost for God. This is why not any Bible is sufficient for Him. Mm -hmm. It has to be His nature yeah. that He is seeing because He is pleased only with His nature, that's the divine nature, and a perfect human nature. Mm. Amen? Amen? Amen. Right, good. Let's look at Titus 2.10 real quick. Adorning doctrine, not purloining, but shewing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. Titus 2.10. So as that verse states, God is in everything that He does and everything that He is leading us into, adorning the doctrines of God. Hmm. Now, we oftentimes say, and you've said it many times, the uh, order of God. Hmm. Why, is the, why are the books gathered mm -hmm. uh, inclusively and exclusively, yes. some in, some out? Yes. Why are they in the order they're in? Why are the chapters divided by Him? Why are the verses parsed by Him, which is what we're seeing today? Mm -hmm. Because of the doctrine of God, that He is a God of order, right? Mm -hmm. So we see everywhere the doctrine of God, and we're seeing that no less in the verses than in the chapters, the books, etc. Let's take a look at some miracles, wonders, signs in the King James Bible that adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things, including the finished Bible. The total number of verses in the Old Testament is adorning the doctrine of God. The total number of verses in the Old Testament is 23,145 verses in the KJV. What looks like a random number of verses or a handful of numbers can be immediately seen doctrinally for what they are. If we use our eyes to organize these numbers, we have one, two, three, four, five. Even running in the background of the King James Bible is the Old Testament truth that God is counting. The Old Testament, in a word, is about the law, and the law is all about God counting. Counting your sins, counting your trespasses, counting your days, counting your judgment. God is running doctrinal reinforcement in the finished Bible, underlining the clear revelation of the Word of God that the count will be against you if you approach Him by the measure of the law. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God 
it is evident. For the just shall live by faith. Galatians 3.11 Just like that paragraph said, the law is about counting and exact measure. And even in our commandments, we have those ten commandments. God is keeping track of all these things according to count. Mm -hmm. Exactly. One, two, three, four, five. Keeping track. Mm -hmm. And God has been keeping track. <laughs> Absolutely. He loves to count. Mm -hmm. He loves to count. I want to show you uh, something. Take a look at this. We saw this earlier in the program. Let's review it real quick. Simple gematria. The Hebrew Aleph has the numeric value of one Hebrew. The Greek Alpha, numeric value one. English A, one. So B would be two, C would be three, D would be four. God employed gematria in the Hebrew scriptures, Old Testament, Greek scriptures, New Testament, and in the finished King James Bible, English. So, how many verses, using simple gematria, have the value of the King James Bible, which is 1611, the year the King James Bible was finished? How many verses equal in gematria the numeric value 1611? That's what we're asking. Well, the answer is right here in front of you. These are all of the Old Testament verses that if you were to add up all the letters, giving them their numeric assignment, they would equal 1611, 1611. Here's all the New Testament verses that would equal 1611. We have nine Old Testament verses. Remember, nine is the number of judgment. We've covered that many times. Is the Old Testament not the book of judgment? Are we not judged by the law? In the New Testament, we have five. Five verses in the New Testament. And what is the New Testament known for? Five being grace, the uh, saving doctrine of the judgment of the law. Together, that gives us 14 verses. 14 being the number in Scripture of redemption. Think of the first Passover on the 14th day. This is adorning the doctrine of God our Savior on the level of 1611, as in the 1611 King James Bible. Wow, that was really amazing. Just, I gotta learn a little bit more about the gematria so that I can get deeper into that. And that's just it's very amazing. simple. Yeah. Just and there's calculators numeric online yeah. that you can literally type in a verse and it'll tell you the simple English mm. gematria. It'll add it all up for you. Yeah. So okay. there's no error in my edition. The computer has done it all. <laughs> but hey, that's a finished Bible for you. Yes, it is. 1611, revealing the doctrinal mm -hmm. adornment of the Old Testament yes. with the nine, yep. judgment, and the doctrinal adornment of the New Testament, the five, the grace. Put them together, and you have the redemption of the Lord. Mm -hmm. 1611, King James Bible. It's back here. Mm -hmm. It's there. It's everywhere we look. It's screaming at us. Now, I'm sure since God has an adorning doctor, like he's adorned the King James Bible, and since Satan is the great imitator, he has to have imitated this thing, so there must be a, an adorning doctrine of the devil too then. Uh, the devil adorns his doctrines as well, mm. absolutely, because uh, he does everything that God does, like you said. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look. What I have here is a screenshot from Google. Was Mark... 16, 9 through 20, originally part of Mark's gospel. Well, this has been a long-standing uh, textual critics controversy for as long as I have been alive. Are you familiar with that? That they mm -hmm. have certain sections of scripture that they want to say are not in the original manuscripts? Yes. This is one of them, right? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, let's take a further look at this. Just to confirm, let's click on one of the links of the endless pages and we go to the Gospel Coalition where it says, underlined, uh, not a recent development. Christians have known for centuries that Mark 16, 9 through 20 might not have originally been part of Mark's Gospel. Lo and behold, adorning the doctrine of the devil. There are 678 verses in Mark's Gospel. That's Mark 16, 9 through 20. That's 12 verses that they want to take out. 
when we have the 678 verses and we take out the 12 verses they want to take out, that leaves us 666 verses or the infamous 666. From God? I don't think so. That's amazing. That's an example of how man wants to do what man wants to do with God's word and changing into man's word. Six being the number of man. How many times have I said on this program, worst case scenario, these Bible translations are from the devil. Mm. That's an example of it. Yeah. Best case, they're wood, hay, and stubble. Mm -hmm. The chaff of man. Yeah. Whoa. Mm -hmm. But don't worry, because the Lord knows his own. Mate number one, Ezekiel 9, 4. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Look at its mate. Revelation 9, 4. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. I love that part right there. That was great. Very clear matings. And it's, it's amazing because one of them, you have to have the mark. <laughs> and you don't have the mark if you're reading from one of these other books that think that they're Bibles. There's no mark. They're, they're missing a whole part of the mark. <laughs> yeah. Well, they take out their verses from Mark 16, mm -hmm. and uh, they are carrying around, mm. if not literally in their Bible, in their hearts, mm -hmm. 666 verses from Mark. That's right. Adorning yeah. the doctrine of the devil. God save them. God is spectacular everywhere we turn. His works are staggering to us, and his acts are limitless. He telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. Great is our Lord, and of great power. His understanding is infinite. Psalm 147, 4 and 5. Christian reader, do you really believe that God has numbered the stars and calls them each and every by their name? It is unthinkable and unconscionable to believe that God has done this with the stars that fall from the sky, but as for the verses of the precious Bible, which shall never pass away, he has not. Every verse is accounted for and is in its proper place and has its own name. The verse, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me, has a name, and that name is Philippians 4.13. The verse, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding, has a name, and that name is Proverbs 3, 5. The verse, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, has a name, and that name is Jeremiah 29, 11. The verse, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine, is named Song of Solomon 6, 3. Put on the whole armor of God is named Ephesians 6.11. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper is named Isaiah 54.17. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage is named Joshua 1.9. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want is named Psalm 23.1. These are all very famous verses and names. To say you know the verse but not the address is comparable to saying... I recognize your face, but I can't remember your name. To think that mere men have assigned divisions and reference numbers to the Bible for incidental handiness and not acknowledge that God has placed and named all his verses is far, far away from trembling at his word. Hear the word of the Lord, ye that tremble at his word. And the name is Isaiah 66, 5. The part reminds me of the sheer amount of detail that God is obsessed with. He is completely focused on the details. When we look up in the sky and we see all those stars, even the ones that we can't see, but they are there. To, the idea that he put them all there, he knows exactly where they are, and he knows every single one's name. And we will and never number. know. Yeah, yeah, and, and how many. And we'll never know that information, but he's given us a book with such amazing detail that we should know all the words, all the verses, all the numbers, all the names. It's a revelation from the lesser to the greater. Mm. If God has 
named and numbered the stars which fall from the sky, that's what the word says, then how much more obvious should it be to us that the word which shall never pass away mm -hmm. is named and numbered as well by him. Amen. From the lesser to the greater. Yeah. Look, it's confirmed everywhere in the word. Uh, he calleth his own sheep by name. Mm -hmm. The very hairs of your head are all numbered. That's right. That's a naming and a numbering. Yeah. In fact, I can't resist. Take a look at that. Mates, he calleth his own sheep by name. That's John 10, 3. The very hairs of your head are all numbered. That's Matthew 10, 30. You'll notice 10, 3 and 10, 3. Not counting the zero because it has no value. <laughs> That's great. Just another little nugget to throw out there at the end, letting people know. It's, it's, a, it's a nugget for yeah. those who believe, and it's a jab yeah. for yeah. those who do not believe. Absolutely. But you know, it's God's perfection. Mm. Simply put, it's God's utter joyful perfection. Amen. Just like stars, the verses are numbered. And just like stars, the verses are named. And just like stars, the verses are all differing in glory. For one star differeth from another star in glory, 1 Corinthians 15, 41. The above cited verses being all famous in glory, at the end of the last chapter, we cited a not so famous verse, which by name be 1 Chronicles 27, 1. We said that despite its mundane appearance and seeming insignificance, it had need to be called into divine order. We said, by its proper placement in the 365th chapter of the Bible, this verse matched its quotation as it is written, month by month throughout all the months of the year. Let's look at it and close another chapter with it again. Now the children of Israel, after their number, to wit, the chief fathers and captains of thousands and hundreds, and their officers that served the king in any matter of the courses, which came in and went out month by month throughout all the months of the year. Of every course were twenty and four thousand. First Chronicles 27, 1. Beyond being in the proper chapter, as a standalone verse, this is verse number 11,111, bearing the relationship to its content, thousands and hundreds. Although this verse lacks an outward sense of greatness, like other famous verses, it is full of the glory of the Lord, even a double portion, if we would just take our time to get to know it in the King James Bible. In this way, the body of the Bible is again exactly designed like the human body and like the body of Christ, giving higher decoration to the less striking parts for the sake of the overall balance of beauty of the whole. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. 1 Corinthians 12, 23 and 24. You know, 1 Chronicles 27, 1 uh, is not on anyone's top 10 uh, <laughs> memorized scripture list. No. So it doesn't have the obvious glory. But we saw last week that it does have a hidden glory, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Because we saw month by month throughout all the months of the year, uh, is revealing mm. uh, the 365 day a year calendar because First Chronicles 27 is the 365th chapter of the King James Bible. Mm -hmm. And that there's a hidden glory there to the one who finds it. Mm. Well, uh, the Gentile calendar being prophesied there is showing us that glory, um, contrary to the 360 day Jewish calendar, which reappears in Revelation because God's going to deal with Israel in the end. Uh, that's the first measure of glory. But it has a double portion uh, because we saw today that it reads thousands and hundreds. And if we look at its verse slot position, it's 11,111th verse. Mm -hmm. So we have a one, 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 yeah. according to its plain speaking of thousands and hundreds. Mm -hmm. So that it comes together for a double portion of glory yeah. in the King James Bible. Uh, famous verses stand on their own. Mm -hmm. 
Other verses don't. And I want to show you a verse, and I'll ask the question, uh, is this a famous verse? No. Uh, yet we're going to see it has glory, but the glory is hidden, okay? And it's going to be from Daniel. We're going to work real quick in the book of Daniel and see some miracles, wonders, and signs. So I ask you, is this not a special verse? Now among these were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Daniel 1, 6. This verse is also not on anyone's top 10 scripture memory verse list. We're going to come back to it. We're going to set it aside. And we're going to see how its mates bring glory to it. We're going to go to Daniel 3, which is a special chapter. Now, this is the famous chapter of the burning furnace that the Hebrew boys are cast into. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold, whose height was three score cubits, and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. Verse 1. Now, notice three score and six. Six, six. We have a six, six. Image of gold, three score cubits, and six cubits. The three score is a 60. The six cubits is a six. Hold on to that because we're going to be adding one more six to it because what Nebuchadnezzar is raising is a picture of the mark of the beast. Next in Daniel 3, a special chapter, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. Verse 5 and 6. And notice the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer is six instruments. We already had six and six. Now we have the third six. Three score and six, 66, is shaping the beast up to be 666. Like the scholars who want to take out the last 12 Mark verses. Here it is. Next, Daniel 3, a special chapter. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, everybody knows those three, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. We know they would not worship. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God, verse 23 and 25. Now let's start to look at the mirroring. Nebuchadnezzar uses God's people to reveal the image of the beast. But what's really taking place in the spiritual dimension in mirroring, we're going to see that God uses Nebuchadnezzar to reveal the image of God's people. Watch this. This is God's famous candlestick, image of gold. It was made in gold, same as Nebuchadnezzar's idol. And it has seven candlesticks. So we see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in slots one, two, and three. And we see the fourth is like the Son of God, Daniel 3.25. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, Revelation 1, 13. So Jesus is in the midst, slot number four. But what about five, six, and seven? They are empty. Well, we're back to not a special verse, Daniel 1, 6 again. Now among these were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So we see that they are the mirroring other side of the candlestick, the image of gold. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego in slots 1, 2, 3. The fourth like the Son of God, Daniel three twenty five, And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. That's from Revelation 1, 13. Here we see him walking with them in the fire. And the mirror is revealed in the 1, 6 verse of Daniel. The other and true names of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are... Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Together, this all is revealing 
the image of gold, not of Nebuchadnezzar, but of God, the seven candlestick. Back to Daniel 1.6, not a special verse. We know it is now. Now among these three were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Daniel 1.6. Now look uniquely, when we take that one, the sword of the spirit, and we drive it into the six and divide that six, we have a three, the one in the middle, and a three on the other side because it's been divided. Three, one, three, and we're back to the candlestick that was revealed in the other chapter of Daniel. Coding, mm -hmm. uh, we're talking real science. Yes. Real science. Yeah. God putting his word together in such a way, revealing his handiwork. Mm. Just like he put the human body together, just like he put the water together that we began the show with, mm -hmm. on that scientific level yeah. of chemistry. Yeah. So is the true word of God. Mm -hmm. I always know chapter and verse of Daniel where I will find the real names of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If anyone asks me, I say, oh, that's in Daniel 1, 6. Mm. Well, why do you remember that? It's such an odd verse to remember. Because I know that the one drives into the six, leaving a 3, 1, 3, which is a picture of the candlestick, which is all explained <laughs> in Daniel 3. This is how I memorize so much scripture. Wow. You know when we have Bible study and mm -hmm. you want to know a verse, you're like, Gary's going to know where that verse is. Mm -hmm. Why do I know? Because all of this handiwork that's been shown to me by the Lord mm -hmm. gives me the pictures I need to quickly and easily know where everything is in the Word. Amen. And the Lord increases it the more I see these things that He freely gives us of miracles, wonders, and signs. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We have only one paragraph left in this chapter. Let's get into that. We again close chapter with the reminder that our sampled verses are a mere token of the vastness of remarkable verses in the finished King James Bible. Again, the scope of this book is only to illuminate you to this truth that you may believe God willing. Even though you keep saying these are just a small amount, we have covered so many examples, so many demonstrations of the power of God's word all throughout from cover, what I really love about it is it's Old Testament, it's New Testament, it's mated from one to the other. It's just... It's, it's just, on the surface. Yeah. It's, it's underneath. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's the height, the width, the depth, the breadth yes. of the wisdom yeah. of God. When we In the beginning, when we were talking about water, and we had the graphic behind you of the makeup of the water and then the product of the water, I so much more understand and appreciate now the makeup of the water, what what does it consist of? Because now that I'm seeing this King James Bible and, and the, the books, where they are, the verses, the chapters, all of that, I can see the makeup, the consistency of the King James Bible. And consistency is a good word because it's consistent from cover to cover. It is. This is our water, mm. sweet water. Mm. We saw that in the beginning. Yeah. It's also as it says right here, we've been on this a lot today, mm -hmm. our bread mm. for our daily living, Amen. our bread. And look at bread. What is bread without chemistry? This is the chemistry of bread making. We take it for granted, just like we take the Bible for granted. But behind that bread are all kinds of chemical equations that if they do not take place, you will not get a good tasting product, period. All we're doing is simply acknowledging that when God brought forth his word, he did the same thing. Even the aroma of fresh baked bread, the smell, there are chemical equations for. The smell, the equations must be right in order to be the true bread of God, mm. to be the living water. Mm -hmm. If you do not have the King James Bible, know it or not, you have the bread of affliction, mm. you have the water of affliction. Yeah, That's what the scriptures tell us. That God will give them, because of their lack of desire, the bread of affliction and the water of affliction. Yeah, Come to the King James Bible. Absolutely. This has been an amazing episode. We have looked at the 
the ingredients. Like when we're talking about that bread, you get some really nasty bread if you put some nasty ingredients in it. <laughs> and these other Bibles, their ingredients, they, they're just not, they're not the ingredients of God. Make sure you get the Unleavened real bread right here. That's right. Unleavened bread. That's right. The bread of life. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Above God's Name. I pray that it has enlightened you and that the Holy Spirit will continue to convince you with every single episode that this is the actual finished word of God. Join us on our next episode. We come out almost every week. And uh, make sure that you share this video with both believers and non-believers. Comment down below. Hit the subscribe button for our channel. Like this video. And we will see you on the next episode of Above God's Name. Pray for us.